The most destructive self-habit. You get to decide what it is that would take your score from where it was to where you want it to be. I'm too busy to do this. A few deep breaths can help us ground ourselves. You have to avoid them and play the game better. Maui Mastermind presents the Business Coach Podcast, answering your questions and providing real, actionable insights for building a better, stronger, more profitable business without sacrificing your time, life, or freedom anymore. Well, welcome to the Business Coach. Here we are at episode three, and what we're going to be going through today, I want to share with you is how is it that business owners basically self-destruct themselves in their own companies? Uh, it's a pattern that is all too common, and we'll get into the details. So after this particular episode of The Business Coach, you'll have a firm understanding of what are some of the, the most destructive self-habits, self-management habits that cost business owners big. Generally, this happens to successful business owners who are just starting to grow, and they don't realize their own stupid behaviors cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars to millions to tens of millions of dollars. And I'll share some stories and some examples here. And my goal here is when you leave and when we're done with this video, you'll have the opportunity to better understand yourself and what behaviors to watch out for and how you need to make adjustments such that you are a hugely positive influence on your company. Um, as we go through this here, I guess the, the place I'd like to start is I want you to think about it yourself. Have you ever seen a business owner whose business has failed because of their behaviors, right? Think about what you've read in popular media. Think about the stories that you've, you've seen on the news or on a, on a video online. It, it, the, the world is rife with this, this pattern. And typically the part where it happens is, is when a, a business owner gets to this middle stage of growing their business. So remember, We've talked about this before. There are three in episode one of this podcast. There are three levels to building a business. Businesses go through predictable stages of growth. And by understanding this roadmap through it, we know that at which stage, what we need to be on the lookout for or against, what we need to build, what systems, what internal controls, what team or staff we need, and what should be our main focus at each stage along that progressive curve to level three, an owner independent exit stage company. So a level two business we've broken down to early, middle, and advanced. That middle stage level two is the prototypical owner-reliant company. It's the, the business that works, but only because you, the owner, are there in the center with the business working around you. Advanced stage level two is when the business starts to have a life beyond just the owner. Typically, there are key leaders in at least two of the, we call them pillars of the business, sales, marketing, operations, finance, team, and executive leadership. Now you can break those into six or into seven, but those five functional responsibilities are true for every type of business. You're going to have to do that. And so by having leaders in two or more, you're starting to have systems in place. You're starting to build a culture um, that is not so owner reliant. Most business owners, when they get to that middle stage and they start to do that transition, we actually, in our roadmap, we'll, we'll line out um, that there's a transition, st I won't call it a stage, but a an interim stage between middle stage level two and advanced stage level two. And it's at that interim point that I watch time and time again business owners self-destruct. They don't intend to. They certainly don't um, set out to do that, but they just do it through their behaviors. And I want to share a story. Now, the story I want to share with you is about a business owner. Um, doesn't matter what the person is. We're going to call this woman Gail. Again, it's not her name. Names have been changed to protect the innocent. I want to be respectful about that. But Gail was somebody who had built a, for 20 years a thriving level two middle stage company. And then I met her and we started working with her briefly. And I'll use the word briefly here. And she started growing fast and she really enjoyed that fast growth. But she got a little bit of ego around that, 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 that growth. And what we discovered was very quickly and why we ended the, the coaching relationship, um, was that she was a drama queen. You know, there are certain people in the world that just seem to be magnets for pulling drama in or spewing drama out, and, and Gail was one of those people. She was unpredictable with her staff. She would send late night emails, one, two, three o'clock in the morning, and expect an answer when she got up seven or eight in the morning. Created all kinds of stress for her staff. Um, 
these behaviors, she couldn't even see it about herself. The cost, first she lost her operations later. Her business started shaking on the foundations. They had had this recent burst of growth that we had helped them to do, but now they were shaking because they lost their key leader in that area. Then she lost her marketing leader. Sales started to dip. She wasn't replacing business as it had some natural attrition. And then at that point, the business, which had been going on an upward trajectory, started not just to plateau, but started to go back down. And she panicked. And she ended up selling her company at a steep discount. She never realized the cost her behaviors had on her staff, on her company, and on herself financially. Um, the best I could tell you is that probably based on what the person who bought her business has done, that her behaviors cost her well over $10 million, well over that. Matter of fact, when you look at profits uh, along the way, that probably cost her closer to $20, $25 million and growing because that business without her has continued to thrive. So I want to share what I would consider a really important coaching point here. And again, in this um, podcast, I'm going to pretend that I'm your business coach. And so my coaching to you is, let's, let's take a moment. Let's do an honest look at your actual behaviors. And let's do an assessment here about how your behaviors are. So I want you to be honestly, as we do a self-check, I got seven questions for you here. Now on these seven questions I want to go through with you, I want you to score yourself one to five. Five is best, one is worst. I am on time all the time. How strongly does that apply to you in terms of how true is that about you? If you're on time all the time, impeccable with your use of time, or are you, which would be a five, or are you on time some of the time, but often you're late, maybe a two or three, I am utterly reliable. I meet all my business commitments. How do, you, how do you rate yourself on that? How close does that describe you? If that's like you, absolutely, it's four or five. Five, probably. If that's partially you, that might be a three. How about this one? I regularly create, create blocks of my best time to focus on my highest value activities. Next one I have on here. I behave our company values. This is critical. If I were to watch you, if I was your coach and I came in there and, and followed along behind you and watched you for a week, and I was to, from your behavior, I was going to watch your behavior, and from your behavior, I was going to say, okay, here's what I perceive your company values to be. Based on your behavior, I think this is what you actually espouse and what you actually value. And hopefully they, they pick up really good things. So that's the question that we we're asking on that was, based on your behaviors, do you behave? Not do you believe in I don't care if you believe in them, but do you behave your company values? Next, it's going to ask you number six, I healthfully manage my emotions and my emotional behaviors. When you're tired, when you're frustrated, when you're angry, when you're upset, when you're excited, when you're a little bit uh, uh, feeling down and low, and sad. How do you behave with the people around you? you know, the example I gave you of Gail, she was a bit of a, a business monster around her staff when her emotions kind of spiraled into out of control. At her best, she was really great. That's why her business scaled with a little bit of insight and direction strategically that we gave her as her coach. But when she started to have that success, she gave herself permission for all kinds of behaviors that really should have been pulled out. And the final question here is if my team model my behavior, would my company thrive? If the answer is partial, three or four. Absolutely, a five. Oh my gosh, we would be in real trouble, David. That might be a one or two. So you've just had a chance to self-score. This is just a starting point. You can come back to that and look at that in six months. But I want to share a very different story now um, about a businesswoman who was phenomenal with self-management of her behaviors. And as a result, was able to take her company from that middle stage level two through to advanced stage level two, safely navigating that passage. And ultimately, this is Stephanie and her husband, Jack. Stephanie built a thriving hundred plus million dollar um, level three business. And she did a great job with that until she had her eventual exit when she and Jack sold the company. Now, first of all, with Stephanie, who was a client all the way back early on when we started doing this work 20 years ago, she was a client for about four years. And from that point when she joined with us, she was already an advanced stage level two business. And with that work together, we took her to level three. But, but here's what I'm sharing with you. In that middle to advanced stage, that transition point, that's the danger point that your self behaviors as a leader, as an owner of a business, often can cause your whole business to explode. Now, Stephanie 
Number one, she was impeccable with her word. She was very careful when she made a commitment that she could do the commitment. And one of the things that if you were to meet Stephanie today and you were to ask for something, she's really good about saying, you know what, that's not something I can commit to. Or, yes, I can do that. And here's when you'll have it by. She's really good about framing that. So many people say sure to something, but they can't fulfill it. And so they end up disappointing. Stephanie was so good about up front saying, look, that's outside of my skill set or that's outside of what I'm wanting to do. Thank you for asking, but no, I'll, I'll decline that. Or she would say yes to something and she would follow through so, so very well with that part. She led with her behaviors. Her team modeling her behaviors became in her industry, um, which was in medical device manufacturing, she became, one, or her company became one of the industry's most um, respected in that industry, which is why the company was so valuable at the time of her sale. If you were to go back to that list, she would be a few of them, maybe a four, but on probably five out of, of the seven, maybe six out of the seven, she would be a, a five or a five plus. Now, when she had grown that business by her behaviors, here's the coolest part, her behaviors became her company culture. And this is something I want you to think about. How you behave, your company values or not, how you behave day in, day out. It starts like a, like a coral reef, small layer by layer by layer by layer by layer by layer. And ultimately, all these things, what you're building with this is you're building your company culture. Now, one of the most important things to go from a middle stage level two business into advanced stage level two and eventually to level three is for you to build this company culture. The company culture is what allows you to have behaviors stay really good with your staff, even in the moments when things get stressful, um, strained, tough, challenging. It's the invisible hand that shapes behavior of your staff. And so Stephanie knew that by her behaving consistently consistently every time she did she put another layer down like we said that coral reef and before she knew it, she built this beautiful ecosystem this beautiful culture inside of her company so what I want to do right now is I want to go through what I think are five of the most essential um, self-management five of the most essential self-management um, behaviors or, 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 or insights that you have to master you have to. Number one, you have to be great at using your time. If you're not great at using your time, um, what's going to happen is your staff's going to become less and less focused, more and more diffracted, more and more scattered all over the place. You model that through your behaviors. Next, you must master what you choose to focus on and what you allow the company to focus its energies on. It's not enough for you to um, say, hey, I'm, I'm personally choosing good things to focus on but you've got to help your company and then your department leaders, your pillar leaders, making sure that collectively your executive team and through them as you grow are focusing on the right things at the right times. It's so important for what you've got going on. Next, you're going to have to make sure that you're master being impeccable with your deliverables. Now, what's a deliverable? You know, a deliverable is anything that you have promised to somebody else to, to do. Um, whether that promise be to yourself or to a team member or to a vendor or to a supplier or to a customer or to a prospect in the marketplace or to an industry colleague. How you deliver on your promises is huge. Now, as we do this, I guess what I'd, I'd like to say here is let's come and just talk real briefly here. There are different types of deliverables. I'm going to just make a distinction between two very important types of deliverables that no one really thinks about. So first of all, these are two different types of deliverables. So the first we'll call these explicit deliverables, explicit. These are things that you've actively said, I will do X for you, or yes, I will take that on and own it. But the second type of variable is the one that damages your, your reputation and your credibility with your team and other people is what I'll call phantom deliverables. Phantom deliverables are those things that the other party thinks you've agreed to, but you really don't think it yourself that you've, you've agreed to them. So one of the things that Stephanie, I, I love the idea that I learn just as much from clients over time as I've ever learned from my own direct experiences. It's probably one of the reasons that as a business coach, 
I've been able to get better and better and better at business. I, I would say that I'm a well above average business person, right? As a business owner, you know, on a scale of one to 10, I probably self-rate myself eight, eight and a half. But as a business coach, I give myself a 10 plus. Why? I've had hundreds of experiences directly running companies my own self. Hiring staff, deploying them, leading, um, marketing products and services, how to do the operational fulfillment, the financial pillar, managing cash flow, right? But at the same time, for every one direct experience, as a coach, having worked with literally tens of thousands of business owners, um, with over a thousand different companies and a hundred different industries and verticals, that's giving me a massive amount of leverage to see and be with and learn from so many more. One of the things that Stephanie taught me here was she had built such a reputation in her industry that she was later invited to be part of her industry trade association. And eventually, she became the chairperson of that industry association, which raised the profile of her company, which made it worth tens of millions of dollars more when she went to sell that company. And one of the things she shared with me, she said, David, by man, she didn't use the word phantom deliverables. She had a different word for it, but we're going to call it phantom deliverables. By making sure what I could not commit to and making it explicit, or if it was a phantom deliverable I could do, by making it explicit, she manufactured a reputation in her world, manufacturing it happened to be, of a woman who was incredible, impeccable. When she said X, it would happen. How many times do you softly give an answer that's nonspecific, ambiguous, and the other person thinks you've made a commitment? But you think, well, I didn't really commit. So you being impeccable with your word is one piece. Mastering your deliverables. The other part is, on the explicit, how are you capturing every commitment, every deliverable that comes up? You know, I, all the time I, when I coach um, clients and we talk about their meeting behavior, one of the things that happens in meetings is one value of having a meeting of two or more people is you can get clear on key action items out of that. How well do you numerate those action items? Okay. Carl, out of this meeting, there are four steps we said we'll get done. You own three of them. You own step number one by this date and time, step number two by this date and time, step number three by this date and time. I own step number four by this date and time. We make it explicit. We've captured it in some fashion. Now, some of you are my digital folks, and you've got you know, your phones, and you're putting it into some to-do list, Asana, or a project management tool, or something else. Wonderful. Todoist, whatever it might be. Now, some of you are more my old school paper people, and I happen to be one of those paper people, and we write it down on a list. I keep a business journal. What is it that you do to capture in a place that you regularly review back to to make sure you're capturing those deliverables? And when you get really clean about making all your deliverables explicit and captured, what you become very good about is which phantom deliverables to eliminate and which phantom deliverables that you're going to actually bring over and make explicit. And what that does is it releases the pressure of this anxiety of what's out there that I've committed to that I'm not aware of that. So going back to our list here, number one, we have to master our use of time. Number two, we have to master our focus. Number three, we have to be impeccable with how we manage our deliverables. Number four, you must manage your attitude. <sighs> the earlier example of Gail, maybe a little bit self-important, was her attitude. Um, a little bit like uh, narcissistic, the world revolved around Gail. Didn't really take time all when he went for much of her day. Didn't take time to be open to what was going on in her staff's lives. So your attitude, are you letting frustration bleed through? And I'll just to share with this, some of us think, oh, I'm really good at uh, at containing my emotions. I used to think this. I used to think this. Uh, my wife, who I've been married to, Heather. Now we've been. Uh, 20 plus years now. We're about to come up to our 21st anniversary. We've been together 25 years. Um, it's one of the most emotionally intelligent human beings I've ever met. And one thing I learned from her early on, this is back when she was in grad school for psychology, uh, the right livelihood for her. She is so good as a therapist with people. But I would say that, you know, she'd say, you're upset. And I'd say, no, I'm not upset. She said, I can tell. And I say, I'm doing my best to contain this. I don't want to bleed this through. She's like, you know, your body language is so loud, I, I can't even hear what you're saying. It's so loud. Just make it, make it explicit. Share with me what's going on for you. 
And in the business world, when I finally realized that there were times when my judgmental nature, I think everyone has different qualities. Some are wonderful and some are tougher. My default tougher piece of me is I can be judgmental. I don't know what it is for you. All of us have behaviors that are really wonderful for us and other behaviors that are less wonderful or, or, or defaults that we have to be aware of and we have to mature them over time. So for 25 years ago, I was judgmental and very fast to that. And then later I thought I was being better 20 years ago about covering that over and just not sharing it. I would share it with other um, business counselors outside of the situation, but not directly with my staff or my team. And what I discovered was I was bleeding with body language. People are so good at reading body language. It is hardwired into human beings. We think that our attitude, it, we can cover it over, gloss it over with a, a coat of paint. It doesn't work that way. Your staff knows what's going on. Your customers know how you feel. You can fool some for a period of time, but over time, especially your staff, who are there with you and watch you day after day, month after month, year after year, they can read what's going on for you. So you have to be really careful about how you're feeling with that part. I'll give some coaching about how to do this in a moment. But let's go to the next one here. You don't just have to master your attitude, but this one is incredibly important. You have to master your emotional behaviors. Now, what do I mean by your emotional behaviors? When you feel a strong emotion, could be a motion of, of elation. We just had a massive victory. It could be a motion of frustration. You know, I can't believe that team member did that again. I've told him many, many times, and he still does it that way. It drives me flipping crazy. It could be um, hurt or disappointment or whatever that is. We tend to have behaviors that come out. We call these emotional behaviors, and most times people aren't even aware that they have these emotional behaviors. So let's give a couple of examples for this. You know, um, I'll share one for me. When I'm not aware of it, when I'm upset, that I can be really judgmental, which leads to me being critical. I might give one or two things that went well, we call these liked the best, and one or two next times, you know, what can you do better to improve? But without realizing it, when I'm in emotionally in a place where I'm not balanced, where I haven't managed my emotional behavior, I tend to go too much on the negative side, too many, um, Points of feedback would be the polite way of saying it or too, too hypercritical. So knowing that about myself over the last 10 years, I've worked hard on it. I am still not a master of that at all occasions, but I am worlds better. Where I was once upon a time a five or a six, I'm probably a eight and a half and a, at, at times to a nine, but probably an eight and a half. And I'm, I'm, I'm committed that I want to get above a nine on that and keep growing. Why? Because to me, business is a path for self-growth. I, I love that idea about business as a, a way for me to become a better person. That said, what's emotional behavior for you? Um, I can remember one business owner I work with that his emotional behavior was avoidance. That when he felt emotionally dysregulated or he felt a strong emotion, he would just avoid situations. He would not return phone calls for staff. He would have vendors or strategic partners that he would ignore for a period of time. Or he would be in a meeting with somebody, he would agree to it, and then he would just disappear and not do it. He wouldn't manage his deliverable about that. That's an example of an emotional behavior that hurts. That growth period from middle stage to advanced stage level two, that transition, it's critical that you take control of your emotional behaviors. It's critical. Now, a couple of things to, to build on with this. You know, we talked in episode number two that you've got to master your use of time, right? So if you if you have not watched episode two or listened to episode two, go back to it. That's a really important one. We talked about that. We talked about how for you, um, it's not enough to just have some thoughts or some ideas uh, around time use. You need a structure for your time. The intention to be better with your use of time is not enough. Willpower is good for a day, a week, possibly a month. We call that a sprint. But willpower is not going to win a marathon. And a business person, we all know this, as a business leader, building and growing and scaling a business is, in fact, a marathon. Matter of fact, it's multiple marathons stacked one after the other. Um, I live in a town called Jackson. I'm thinking of, of a guy, Chris, who was my neighbor for a number of years. And he used to go with his wife, Julie. They used to go run ultra marathons, 50 or 100 mile races, crazy stuff. But a business, to scale it over 10, 15, 20 years of the the life cycle of a company, that's in many ways more exhausting 
than running a 100-mile race. Now, granted, I don't think I would be physically able to run that 100-mile race right now, and I can build a company, but you get my point. In addition to that, when we think about it, we need structure. So please, if you haven't, go back to episode two. Look at the time structure we gave you for how to go about that. It really is important. Um, I also want to talk about you know, this idea of mastering your deliverables, being impeccable with your deliverables. I think it's incredibly important for us to just touch on this. If you want to scale through level two middle stage to level three, or even to advanced stage level two, you've got to be impeccable with your word. And I want to talk about one more thing, which is what I call closing the loop. Closing the loop. So let's come back to Stephanie as a great example for this. Um, when you look at a deliverable you've made, and you've made all your deliverables explicit, Step number one. Step number two, you've captured all your deliverables. Step number two. Of course, now that you've captured deliverables, you've got to do something called actually do, right? You've got to finish, complete all your deliverables. And most people think, huh, if I'm explicit of what I've committed to, I've captured it in writing so I make sure that I, I, I don't miss it, it doesn't slip through the cracks, and then I actually get it done, right? I, I get it done. I'm, we think, okay, that's all it takes to be... Um, really good self-management behavior. And that's not true. There's one missing step here. There's a step number four that's missing. We call this close the loop. So many times people get in trouble in business. And I see this with the owners we coach. And, and sometimes it takes a month or two of follow-up. Sometimes it takes a couple of years before they really lock onto this lesson. I want to give it to you. It's a gift. Please grab onto it. The value of what I'm about to share with you is it lets you sleep at night. A value for you is it creates a culture in your business of a higher level of accountability. It'll create a reputation in your industry that you are the go-to company for your product or service line. So you, you've captured the explicit the deliverable. You've done it, but I've now got to close the loop. I've got to make sure that the person I committed to understands that I've delivered, and I've got to make sure that they feel that the delivery was up to their satisfaction that, that really did meet what they feel I committed to. So closing loop might be as simple as in a meeting. Uh, I might say to Will, hey Will, you own this particular action step by this Friday. Here's how I want you to close the loop. I want a quick email that says it's been done. Or I want you to check off on our project management tool that it's been done. Or I might say on your next week's big rock report, um, I want you to put a, 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 you know, that it's been closed and any, any update about that that would be important. Or the next time we meet in two weeks, I just want you to quickly let me know that this was done. You get to decide what it is. So on small, more task-specific deliverables, you as a leader asking for how you want the loop close, or on the other side of it, you making sure that when you've committed to do something, you go back to the other person and say, hey, you know, Geraldine, here is the contract that you asked me to send to you. I wanted to make sure that I delivered on what I promised, right? I'm making it explicit that the loop has been closed. I haven't just made that promise to get something done, but I've actually captured it, done it, and then I've closed the loop so that the accountability loop has been closed. Really important. It's a subtle point, but when you do that on a grand scale, and also if it's a bigger project piece, I should talk with, with Geraldine and say, hey, Geraldine, here's what you asked for. Um, take a look at it. If there's anything about that that you need to be different, please let me know, and I'd be happy to make those adjustments. Right? Or, hey, Geraldine, it's now been a week. I've delivered it to you. I wanted to circle back one last time. Did I get you exactly what you needed? Are you happy with what I got you? That's a way just to get a feedback loop to manage those deliverables over time. Um, now, in terms of managing your attitude, I want to just make a, a distinction here. I need you to take an honest, hard look at what your behaved attitude is. You know, we think that we have an attitude, but many business owners, what I notice for them is that their behaved attitude is very different than what they think their attitude has been. So let's do an example. If you were to look over the past 30 days, look over the last month, and rate your attitude at work where five is best, one to five, you might say, David, I've had a crappy attitude. It's been a tough, a tough month for me, a two. Or David, I've been great. I've, we've been on a high. I've been in a good spot. I felt enlivened by what I'm doing in the business. I'd rate a five. Wonderful. What are two or three examples of your attitude 
how you behave your attitude at its best. Well, David, when my attitude's at its best, I'm really calm with other people when something goes wrong. Or, David, I'm, I get really excited when someone has a, a, a progress point and I make a big deal out of that progress point. I really applaud that work. Or you might say that, David, when I'm, when I'm behaving my attitude at its best, I tend to be a very certain uh, confidence person in the company, that people look to me <clears throat> and they draw a lot of confidence from what I'm able to, to do for the company. Like they, I, I'm a voice of certainty for them. Now let me ask one more question. How could you go from your current number a, a little bit higher? What, what one behavior would you need to be doing on a more consistent basis that would take your score from where it was to where you want it to be? Or if your score was already at the upper end, what's one or two behaviors that you want to make sure that you maintain doing because that's a good behaved way of showing that your attitude's right? Take a moment and just jot that down. Look, part of you as a business owner is you leading your staff. And you leading your staff is what goes from a middle stage to advanced stage. To, to do that jump, you've got to start being better getting stuff done through other people. Through other people. And that requires the self-management, the behaviors around that part. Now I want to talk one more thing uh, about behaved attitude. I want to talk about something we call hygiene. So I think this is a really important point here which is attitude is a hygiene activity. What does it mean to be a hygiene activity? It's not like you take care of your attitude once and it's done forever. Attitude is kind of like, like any other type of, of self-grooming, right? You, you need to take a shower every day, right? If you've worked out, you need to get the sweat off, right? Um, you're gonna brush your teeth once, twice a day, every day. It's a hygiene activity. So what do you need to do to keep yourself in a good place? What is it that you need to do? Um, what keeps your attitude right? You know, I've got some owners of companies that we've coached that would say, David, for me, it's getting my hands in the dirt. I love gardening. If I can get my hands in the dirt and grow something, it, it's my happy place. Um, for other clients that we've coached, they would say, David, for me, I need a really hard workout. I need something that gets me sweating and my heart rate up. Wonderful. Other people say, you know what? I just want to take a reflective walk in a beautiful spot. If I can do that for an hour each day, you know, there's a lake nearby where I live, I just feel good. Others would say, David, if I can just read a book, just have half an hour to an hour to read each day. Someone else would say, David, for me, if I start the day with prayer, my whole day is better. My attitude is rooted. I recognize that it's not about me, that there's a higher power out there, that, 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 and I'm not that higher power, right? So what is it for you? These hygiene behaviors, as a company starts to have growth, it's a pattern that I see, that as they have growth, the owner starts you know, flipping out a little bit. And so once upon a time, how they handle that growth no longer works. And so what they do though, is they try to do what they've always done before, but they do that just faster, longer hours. So if, if, if you can think about it, this is you as a level two middle stage company. And what worked for you as a middle two level stage company doesn't work as you start to grow. As you start to grow and expand the business, you go from a million in revenue to 1.5 in revenue, to 1.75 in revenue. And at a certain point, you hit 2 million in revenue. And then again, you're trying to do your business just by working longer, harder. And what happens is, as you do that, there's more strain, there's more pressure. We've got to qualitatively do the business different when we want to go from level two middle stage, an owner-reliant company, to moving into the advanced stage level two, which is the starting point of an owner-independent business, into level three, which is a true ind owner-independent business. So in the, as a stress happens, here's the pattern. The owner says, I don't have time, so they stop doing all those hygiene activities that made them such a better person to be around. They stop eating well. You know, they don't get as much sleep. They aren't exercising anymore. They don't meditate. They don't take time for prayer, whatever it is for them. They don't take their walk around the lake. I'm too busy to do this. What they don't realize is their business will get trapped at a certain point because as it grows beyond there, it'll collapse back on themselves because of their very own behaviors, including in this case, attitude and emotional behaviors. So the way out of that trap is actually counterintuitive. It says, make sure we make time for these hygiene activities that makes my soul sing. You know, my wife's a potter. If she gets into the pottery studio, she is in such a good mood. She is on cloud nine. 
What is it for you? For me, I like to take a walk listening to audio, um, an audible book or, or a podcast. That for me is how I kind of center and ground myself. For me, I also like to journal. Um, so most days, if not five days a week, I'm going to take 10, 15 minutes. I reflect on the day. What, what were the victories that I had? What things did I do that progressed me forward in my important goals? What were my magic moments with my family? What were the things that I'm, blessings in my life that I'm grateful for? And I'll write a half a page or a page. And that just grounds and roots me. What's the hygiene activity for you? Because when you do that, what happens is you start to recognize and you're able to grow the business bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's a common pattern that we need to have you watch out for, those self-behaviors. So in terms of mastering your emotional behaviors, let's take that for a moment here. How do we make sure that you're, ma you know, what tends to upset you? Let's ask that. What tends to, to knock you off balance? What tends to emotionally dysregulate you? Like, I hate dealing with, you know, um, billing disputes. Like, you know, for our company, like many of you, I have various credit cards that we use to manage cash flow and expenses. It's got good consumer protections. And it's a simple way for a team member or for recurring expenses to be handled. One credit card just for recurring expenses. One credit card for this particular team member to use in operations. One credit card for this person to use. Right? That is a helpful way. It's easier than going back and cutting checks and all those old school stuff that just simplifies life. And it's financially a bit safer to do as long as you pay attention and audit the credit card statements that come in. I hate it when I see a, a, an item on my credit card. It could be a a $12 charge that just feels wrong. And I start getting a little bit self-righteous and wrapped up into why this is wrong. And before I realize it, I've spent you know, an hour of my time, $2,000 of billable, to deal with a $12 matter. And it just sits there with me. So I laugh at that. So if I can understand that that's there, what I can learn is I can find ways to filter out, to redesign the process so that other people who don't get dysregulated dysreg by that can handle those types of things. All right, so a short list of some, some important healthy emotion habits. I want to just take a moment here and just talk about these real briefly. So here's a short list. Number one, please get a good night's sleep, right? Um, it seems so obvious, but studies have shown that you will lose a massive amount of IQ points, plus you're emotionally much more likely to be short with other people, uh, not at your best, if you don't get a good night's sleep. So get a good night's sleep. Number two, Make sure that throughout the day you're eating low glycemic index foods. You know, when I go into a negotiation, an hour before that negotiation, or even an important meeting, a joint venture partner or, or a meeting with a staff member, an hour before that meeting, I make sure I eat something that's low glycemic index so that it keeps my blood sugar level. Part sometimes of how we behave is that physiologically our blood sugar is dropped and it's, or it's elevated in such a way that it, it now has created a swing for us and, and that hurts our behavior. Next, make sure that you regularly just pause to take a deep breath. You know, as I'm doing this podcast, I'm getting excited. If I were talking with a team member, I might have to read their body language and recognize, slow down, David, right? A few deep breaths can help us ground ourselves, root ourselves. Number four, take a step back in a situation and just ask yourself, what what actually matters here? Uh, I do this regularly as a parent. Oh my gosh, like one of my kids, you know, constantly you will know, leave a light on in the, the bathroom and then they'll walk out. They'll leave their window open in the winter time when we're heating our house. And my first reaction is to go boom and go, can't you get it? I've told you a hundred times. But then I want to pause and I want to take a step back and recognize that I've got four more years home at home with my older two kids before they go off to school or into their lives. I've got seven more years with my youngest, Josh. Do I really want to make it about that? Yes, I need to make sure that I help them learn these things. But what really matters here? What, what matters in this situation? Same thing with the staff member. You know, a staff member makes a mistake on something. Ask yourself, what really is important here? It might be that what they made the mistake on, the important things are to fix the mistake, learn from it to avoid it from the future. It might be that, hey, this really hurt our business because as a consequence, something bad happened. What's important here is that I make sure that, that we never have this happen again. Or it might be that, hey, what's really important here is it's a small matter. I'm going to let that go. The major reason for why, why she was doing the task, she accomplished it. It just was different and maybe a sloppier than I would have done. But it really is good enough. This is not where I want to expend energy training or grooming her. All right, next. 
time your high stakes conversation, this is number five, time your high stakes conversations for when you are at your best. Consider delaying them so that you can be grounded and rooted. I don't want to terminate a team member when at the moment when they've just done something that pisses me off and I'm angry. I need to take a step back saying, you know, look, you need to go home right now. We're going to have a conversation tomorrow morning. Um, I'll meet you in here in my office at 8 o'clock so that I don't have all that roiled up emotion come out the wrong time. Or um, I want to make sure that if I'm, uh, you know, I, I had a crappy night's sleep, that's not the day to deal with a renegotiation of a contract with my largest customer, right? I might have to say, look, can we delay that until Thursday? Um, would that be okay with you? You might not be able to, but generally, if I can time my high stakes conversations from when I'm at my best. Also, what time of the day am I at my best? I tend to be really good, 8.30, 9, 10, 11, 12. But by 1 to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I tend to have a lull. And then I tend to have another burst of energy around 4 or 4.30. Uh, you probably have your own rhythm, but time it so that you're doing it at your best. And number seven, own it. When you screw something up, own it. Own it. Notice it. Acknowledge it to yourself. And if need be, clean up the mess with somebody else. Hey, you know, Richard, I want to apologize. Yesterday I was a bit short with you. I, I, my frustration might have bled through. I wanted you to know it wasn't just you. Um, I had let my lack of sleep the night before, I let my upset about this get the better of me. And really, you didn't deserve that. And, and I want to apologize, and I ask that you forgive me. Um, I'll work better in the future, harder in the future, so that doesn't happen again. Right? Own it. There is a power in you as a leader of a company, owning when times and places where you have made a mistake. And then again, I think it's important. I want to give one last thank you on this episode which is I just want to thank my sweetie. This is my wife, Heather. Um, so we don't keep a TV in our house. We put it just in the garage. Um, you know, if the kids are going to watch TV or we're going to watch TV, I don't want to make it too, too easy. But uh, this is my sweetie, and she's probably the person who, and this is us watching on date night down to Nabby. <laughs> uh, yeah, we had watched all five seasons years ago, and we came back to watch it a second time, only to realize, wow, we'd forgotten most of what had happened. But uh, on Saturday nights, that's our, that's our date night. And... When I look at emotional growth for myself, behavioral growth for myself, she's probably been the biggest spark for that. So who in your life is that person that gives you genuinely, authentically useful, but also kind feedback for you? Is it your coach? Is it your spouse? Is it a team member? Or is it multiple people? Now, what happens when you get all these elements in alignment? Your company's going to thrive. And I've got one more story to share with you, and we'll end this episode of the podcast. Um, this is Ron McVetty. Now, Ron owns a company called Fax Engineering. And Fax is a, a company that makes industrial control parts for manufacturing and other types of, of, of flow parts. They make basically little miniature brains um, for manufacturing plants, I guess is the best way to say it. I've watched Ron over the last seven and a half, eight years that we've been working together, coaching him. Um, grow so much as a business leader. At first, he used to have all kinds of anxiety, um, and he would let this anxiety come into ways that he would interact with his team. And as I've watched how he's managed his behaviors, he has truly been extraordinary, and, and the result is he's built a level three company. He's built a level three business that generates tens of millions a year in revenue, that serves the world, and for his team, he has become just a truly great presence in their lives. His, his team, he's got amazing retention for his team. He's grown it from where he was, the advanced stage level two when we first met him, all the way to level three because of this. So those are my final comments for you. It's a pain sometimes to put the energy in to manage yourself. But two things. When you don't manage yourself, the pain of things going wrong, of fires getting lit, drama, other things that will happen, is much more emotionally expensive. And from a financial perspective, you won't grow beyond that middle stage level two into level three without becoming impeccable as a leader. And part of that is the, the, the behaviors that other business owners evidence that, that really help them self-destruct. You have to avoid them and play the game better. I wish you the very best of luck. Thanks for joining on the episode.